Now we begin to look at the readings of the Mass, 15th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The theme is prophecy. It's amazing how many times this theme comes in this time of the year, you know. Uh, this is July, you know, it's hot, people are bored, they're waiting to go on vacation, and the church says, wait, wait, think about prophecy. Think about the Word. Think about God talking to you. Don't let it get by you. And so, we have this first text here from the prophet Amos. Amos was one of the earlier prophets. He lived in a town called Tekoa, called Tekua today in Arabic. It's, um, if you're standing in Bethlehem and you look across a flat valley, you could just make out a little city nestled at the bottom of the mountains. The other side of the mountains is like Qumran and the Dead Sea and all that stuff. He was from there. And as he's going to say, uh, look, this was not my idea. I didn't decide. I think I'll be a prophet. You know? I had, I, I, I'm, I'm a little farmer. I had a nice little business going. And the Lord told me to do this. That's prophecy. You see? He's called. Everybody with a bright idea Especially every angry person with a bright idea is probably not a prophet. Because the sign of a prophet is love for God's people. None of them wanted the job. The only one who said, here I am, is Isaiah. All the others are not me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm no good at that, God. I'd be a terrible person. You don't want to take me. They don't want the job because they know it's going to make them very unpopular. Uh, and, uh, and, and they just don't want it. But you could imagine this was a man very loyal to the Lord, and the Lord finally talked to him. So, um, in chapter 7, uh, he's up in the north. He's a southerner now, I just told you. He's down in Beth by Bethlehem, across the valley from Bethlehem. And he's gone up to the north to preach. Well, you know, we got south-north in the United States too, you know. Um, much calmer now. Certainly calmer than it was here, because the north had broken away a couple hundred years before, some some time before. And there was great social injustice up in the north, and that makes God very angry. That we would talk that way and treat one another that way, deprive the poor of what they need, that makes him very angry. And there's hardly a prophet who doesn't have strong words from God about this. And it was almost his basic message, practically. And so, if a lion roars, who doesn't get scared? If God speaks, who doesn't prophesy? You got to. That's a, another place in Amos. So, he says now, you see, he's up there preaching away, telling these people, you know, you're selling a poor man for a pair of shoes, you're doing this, you women, you keep telling your husbands, bring me home, more money, you're... You're all very displeasing to God. You're going to get punished. That's what he's preaching. And this is a northern kingdom now. It's not just like us, south-north, you know. This whole of the, with his own king. And so uh, Amaziah, who's sort of the prime minister, goes over to Amos. And he says, Off with you, seer, Jose, not Hosea the prophet, but the word seer, uh, Flee to the land of Judah, and there earn your bread by prophesying. Go play holy man down there. If they want to strip you a few bucks, be happy. But get out of here. We don't want you. We don't want this kind of... You're disturbing the peace. Of course he is. He's telling the rich they've got to stop stealing from the poor, because God is angry. Not because of some abstract social justice, but because God is angry when the poor are uh, oppressed. And he's always identified with them. And so he's telling them, you better stop it or things are going to get worse. But never come up here to Bethel, which is the king's sanctuary. What's he doing with the sanctuary when there's Jerusalem? That's to stop the people from going back down south and getting like in it and weakening his grip on his, on his kingdom. But uh, well, this is the king's sanctuary and a royal temple. 
This is Amos's answer. It's a typical prophetic answer. I am not a prophet, nor do I belong to a company of prophets. They were the traveling holy men, you know, some very good and some not so good at all. I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamores. That's who I am, you see. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy. Now look at the way the Lord talks about them. Prophesy to my people, Israel. And so, that's the prophetic vocation, you see. You're called. If you're not called, you're not a prophet. You can have a lot of great ideas. In this particular area, it's very touchy. There are a lot of people uh, who get very angry about social injustice, you see. Saul Alinsky, for instance, you see. But then they're acting out of anger. They're not acting out of the Word of God. And that whole plan, the only result is chaos. There's no... The haves should become the have-nots, and the have-nots should become the haves. Nothing changes. It's the same injustice, just different people on different ends of the spectrum. That's never the work of God. Prophecy is always love. If you want to see a great example, look at Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, you have this man. Oh, I wonder if we could just... Well, I'll tell you one of them. He starts like this. You led me on, O Adonai. This I'm quoting. And I let myself be led. You forced me, and you won. I can't resist you. You're my God. I love you. I want to obey you. And I, a laughing stock. He's done. He's a southerner talking to southerners. You know, I'm a laughing stock. I have to cry out, violence, Hamas. I'm tired of it. In fact, I made up my mind, I'm not going to talk anymore in his name. And your word turned like fire in my bones. I can't resist any longer. Now that's a prophet. I don't like the job. I'll only do it because I love you and I love your people. And if you're sending me, I'll go. But I know what's in store for me. Most people are going to laugh. They're going to make fun of me. And they're going to be mad as the dickens because I'm telling them to change their life. And Jeremiah who's my favorite, by the way. But maybe you could tell that already. Because I always identify when I talk about prophets. Isaiah, a huge, mystic, literary genius, and had harsh things to say as well. But he was part of the upper class. Jeremiah was from Anatot, a little town just uh, northeast of uh, uh, Jerusalem. So, God says, I want you to stand at the front door of the temple. I've told you this story before. And uh, uh, tell them they're wasting their time coming here because they're not changing their lives. You think burning cows is going to make me happy? If it's, an, if it's an expression of your love for me and you're willing to give to me and to put yourself as part of the offering, okay, for now... Until my son dies, I'll, I'll take that. But to go and, you know, kill five cows and burn them all up and, and then think you've done your religious duty, no. It's like going to Mass and sitting there chatting with your neighbor and going home. You went to Mass, but Mass isn't for chatting with your neighbor. It's for hearing the Word of God, receiving the body and blood of the Lord, and be changed. The law of the Christian life is the law of change. If I'm going to confession now, the same way I was six months ago, there's something wrong. I should be changing. So that's Jeremiah's job. So he goes there and he starts, Heikal Adonai, Heikal Adonai, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They're all stopped. What's he doing now? You know? And he says, look, you're wasting your time. God is telling you, if you don't change your lives, it's got to you any good to go in there and burn cows. It's not going to do it. And they got so mad, they put him in jail. 
but some heard. But you see, God wanted to give them a chance. Prophecy is always a work of love. And love, you know, there's a book about Dorothy Day, a harsh and demanding love. Is that the name of that book? She was a prophet. And she spoke, woof, about taking care of the poor. She picketed with the farm workers, you know, she now her cause is being introduced, which is great, you see. God cares about the poor and he wants us. Now, the only thing bigger on his mind is worshiping the one true God. Not worshiping the stock market, not worshiping the gold exchange, not worshiping the next house you want to buy. You see, it's worshiping God. And then, if you worship God, sharing God's preoccupations. And his preoccupations are care for the poor, fidelity in marriage. These are God's preoccupations. And so, Jeremiah has got to uh, produce you know, this. So, he's saying, I mean, in this case, Amos, look, I'm not a prophet. I don't belong to one of these prophetic guilds. The Lord, I'm minding my own business down there, my little farm. You know, I, was, I had my own herd, and I would, you know, dress sycamore trees. That was my job. And the Lord told me to come and tell you this. Because he loves you, and he's trying to save you from evil, because you can get so stuck in this that you'll never repent, which means when you die, you'll go to hell. And the Lord loves you enough to send me, and I love you enough to obey him and come and tell you. Prophecy is always love. You can always tell. There was a time when we used to have people jumping on the buses in orange saffron robes and shaved heads. They were Buddhist kind of people to tell us what was wrong with us. And it's all right. We are. Whatever they said was probably right. But they were so angry. You say, that's not prophecy. That's not the right kind of anger. You know? And it's the same with people working for social justice. They work. They don't have to be as mixed up as Alinsky, but they're working. Why? Because somebody suffering poverty annoys me. No. Because somebody suffering from poverty is suffering. That's the reason for working for social justice. Not that it bothers me or that I'll feel better about myself because I'm getting in there and, and working for social justice. You're not. You're working for better, perhaps better distribution of wealth. But as I say, that's what Paulo Freire, in his book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and I've said this before too, I think, he says, look, violent change doesn't change anything. It just makes the haves become have-nots, and the have-nots become haves. But the division, the hatred, the injustice, it never changes. Only Christ can change it. And we, right now, have a huge obligation in the church to see that there is true justice, which includes love. You can't work for justice, you see, unless you're at peace. And peace comes from love. So that's Amos' message, you see. We're going to quote just a tiny bit of the Psalm 85. I will listen for what the Lord has to say. Surely he will speak of peace to his people and to his faithful. May they not turn to foolishness. Near indeed is his salvation for those who fear him. Glory will dwell in our land. That's the kavod of God dwelling in the land. So the psalm follows on the prophet, and we'll stop now and change. <laughs>